Now that we know about the four principles of experimental design, it's time to use those and actually design some experiments. So the scenario we're going to be considering here is Pawnee High School deciding to offer SAT prep again this year. They're going to offer it in two different formats, online or classroom teacher. Oh, wow. Okay, well, pre-COVID, this was a great example. Um, let's pretend it's 2018, and these are actually two appropriate choices, either online or in person. <laughs> the counselors want to know which teaching method is going to yield a higher SAT score, so they allow us to set up an experiment. We have 50 students who are signed up to take some form of the class, and let's just say the students don't care which they get. We have 20 seniors and 30 juniors. The first thing we're supposed to do is a completely randomized design. So for a completely randomized design, we are just completely randomizing. Now when you describe an experimental design, you could write out like a paragraph of how you would design the experiment, but more often it's easier to just make a diagram. So that's what I'm going to do here. A completely randomized design means we're not considering like any of the qualities of the students basically, we're just going to randomize. We're starting with all 50 students and then we will randomly assign twenty five students to the online version and twenty five students to the in person version. After that, we'll let them take each class. At the end, we will compare their SAT scores. And that's seriously it. They only asked us to outline a completely randomized design, so we don't have to talk about control, replication, or randomization. This explains how we could randomly assign them into two groups and then compare their scores. Notice that I did write randomly assign. That is important. If the College Board asks you to design an experiment and you want the students to be randomly assigned to the two treatments, you have to write randomly assigned. It's not assumed. If you just went right from 50 students to 25 online, 25 in person, there's nothing to suggest that you want them randomly assigned to those two groups. Okay, the counselors at Pawnee High School hypothesized that the online versus classroom results could be greatly affected by the grade level. Okay, so maybe seniors generally score better than juniors because they've taken the SAT before maybe or they've had more math classes or something like that. So how do we adjust our experiment to ensure that there is an even split of juniors and seniors in each class? Draw a new outline. So I'm still starting with my 50 students but I'm going to start by splitting them into seniors and juniors. We have 20 students who are juniors or sorry seniors and 30 students who are juniors. So I've started by separating them. Now what I'm going to do is basically this exact same design within each of these groups. Oh, the magic of copy-paste. Once I've done that, we're going to compare SAT scores. So a couple things to note here. First of all, it does not matter that we have more juniors than seniors. It doesn't matter at all. We want to get as many people in each group as possible. We don't care. We don't need to send 10 of the seniors home. What we've done here is we've made it so that we can separate out the results based on grade. At the end, we'll be able to say, oh, the senior online students did better than the junior online students, or overall, the online students did better than the in-person students. We'll be able to separate based on grade, and so if grade actually is a factor in how well students do on the SAT, we'll be able to kind of pull that out so that we can focus on just online versus in-person. This is called a block design. I'll put it in a block. It's called block because we've split our sample into two blocks, the senior block and the junior block. Two things to note. First of all, I did not write randomly assign here because I'm not randomly assigning the students to be either seniors or juniors. I've taught statistics for six years, and I've seen a shocking number of tests where a block design starts by randomly assigning students to be either male or female. Like, I just don't, I just don't think you should randomly assign people to be male or female. Um, don't do that. So the blocks aren't randomly assigned. The blocks are based on some variable that you don't want to get mixed up in your response. In this case, the counselors don't want grade level to be mixed up in their response. So they split up the two grades. And then everything after that, they're basically doing the experiment 
that we described in number one in each block. The other thing I want to point out is that the blocks are different sizes and that's okay. We do not have to send away 10 juniors to make sure that we have the same number in each block. It doesn't matter. It's fine. You'll be fine. In this last scenario, counselors are now worried that a student's GPA is certainly going to affect their SAT score. So they want to make sure that we don't end up with all the high GPA students in like the in-person class and all the low GPA students in the online class. Um, even though we're randomly assigning, that could happen. And that would not be good because then one class might do better because they had higher GPAs and not because they were in person versus online. So we're going to focus on just the juniors. This could be done for both juniors and seniors, but um, how could we be sure that the GPAs are evenly distributed? Well, we could line up the juniors from lowest GPA to highest GPA. Then, starting at the top, let's take the two highest GPA students. Let's randomly assign one to do online and one to do in person. That way we ensure that there is one high GPA person in each of the groups. Now we should repeat that moving down the list of GPAs. What we just did is called a matched pairs design. In a matched pairs design, you are specifically matching up people in the two treatments based on some variable that you don't want to become a lurking variable. In this case, it was GPA. We've ensured that there are similar GPAs in each of the two groups. Now really, this is a block design. It's just we've been very specific about who goes into each group. And we could do this um, within our block design from number two. We could say of the 20 seniors, we're going to line them up lowest to highest GPA, and then we will take the two highest, randomly assign them into online and in-person. So it can be a block design, and it can be matched pairs at the same time. The randomized design, completely randomized, is like the most basic, simplest experimental design we have. You use the block design if you know that there's a variable you want to prevent from becoming a lurking variable, for example, grade. And you use matched pairs if there's some variable that you want to avoid, and you can avoid it by specifically matching people up. I also want to point out that the most common version of a matched pairs design is like a before and after experiment. So let's say you have 40 participants and you're measuring like their muscle mass, let's say. And then you have them do some kind of exercise routine for a whole month and then you measure their muscle mass at the end. If you're comparing each person's before muscle mass to their after muscle mass, it's technically a matched pairs experiment because you are pairing each person with themselves. You have the before person compared to their after. So that person is matched with themselves. That's the most common uh, matched pairs design that you're going to see. It's considered matched pairs because you've matched someone with themselves. The nice thing about it is that that person is going to have the same, theoretically, the same diet, the same sleeping habits, like before and after. So the only thing that you're changing there is the exercise routine. Okay, so this example, um, I want you to pause the video and try it on your own, and then when you're done, hit play, and we'll recap the answer together. Okay, so for number one, we have 300 volunteers. We're going to just randomly assign them into three groups. Let's put 100 people in each group. Um, group one is getting advertisement number one. Group two, add two. Group three, add three. And then at the end, we compare the effectiveness. All right, we might have slightly different answers for number two. Um, I said we should block based on familiarity with Jane Austen because... Typically, people who are familiar with Jane Austen are going to watch any Jane Austen movie or TV show that exists, regardless of the advertisement campaign. <laughs> so somehow we assess, like, I don't know, how many books have you read by Jane Austen? And then, like, if you've read more than Pride and Prejudice, maybe you're considered familiar with her. So we somehow split them up. Now notice, I don't know how many people are going to be in these two blocks because, once again, I am not randomly assigning them to be familiar or unfamiliar they are putting themselves in those two blocks. Once they're there, I'm going to randomly assign a third of the people to each ad. And maybe you noticed I forgot to write randomly assign. That was bad. It should say randomly assign right there. Um, and I just wrote one third of the people. Because I don't know, it might be 100 that are familiar with Jane Austen. It might be 250. I'm not sure. 
Then same thing for not familiar, I should have written randomly assigned to add one, two, and three, a third to each. And then at the end, we compare the effectiveness of all six of those groups. In number three, you're just asked to explain why you blocked the way you did. As I just explained, those who are familiar with Jane Austen are more likely to watch the show without seeing any advertisements for it. So I thought that would be a factor. When I've done this with students in the past, some people have brought up um, gender, that maybe females are more likely to watch Jane Austen without seeing any ads. Um, people have brought up age, maybe younger people or older people are more or less likely. So it's kind of up to you. The important part is in number three, you can explain why you blocked the way you did. If you just split up between males and females and you didn't have a reason for it, like you, ha you have to have a reason for splitting up your blocks. So this is one of those parts of statistics where explaining why you did something is really important. Um, it's also why grading a test can be really hard for a statistics teacher because oftentimes students think of things that we don't think of. So as long as you can back up your claim um, for why there might be a lurking variable, you should be in good shape. Before I wrap up this video, I do want to point out easily the most common mistake students make in this unit, um, which is getting sampling methods mixed up with experimental design. So just to recap, a sampling method is how you select people to be in your study. Experimental design is how you set up your experiment once you have those people. So an SRS is randomly selecting people to be in your study where every person in the population has the same probability of being selected. Once you have them, a completely randomized design is when you take those people and you randomly put them into the different treatments. These are not the same thing. And if you're asked, how will you select people to be in your study? And you say, oh, I'll use a completely randomized design. That is wrong. A completely randomized design is how you design the experiment once you have the people. An SRS is how you get those people to be in your study. Um, there's two things on here that I did not mention. So a probability sample, I don't think that's listed on the College Board um, like standards anymore. That's when each person has a different probability of being selected. It's basically like the Hunger Games. Like people's names are in the bowl more often than others because I don't remember. It's been a long time since I've read that book. But I don't think that's a College Board standard anymore. The thing I didn't include over here is the systematic sample, which is where you're selecting every like fourth person. And I also didn't include census because that's not super realistic. And then if we look at experimental design, there's one thing I didn't mention, and that's double blind. Double blind is when the people administering the treatments don't know which treatment is which, and the people getting the treatment don't know which treatment is which. So let's go back to the headache example. Let's say we have a new medication for headaches. Um, we have 50 people in our study, we're going to randomly assign half the people to get the actual new medication and half the people to get the placebo, which is just like a sugar pill. Now there is such a thing as a placebo effect where the people receiving the placebo will say that their headaches were better. And it's this weird psychological thing where they were taking a pill so they just felt like they should feel better, even though it was just a sugar pill and nothing that would actually affect their headaches. Now the experiment is single blind if the participants don't know which treatment they're getting and it should definitely be single blind because if the person knows they're getting a placebo, like what, what? Double blind is when the person giving the treatment also doesn't know which is which. So maybe you label the pills A and B and you don't tell the doctor who's giving them out which one is which. The doctor is just saying, oh, you get A, you get B. Because if the doctor knows which one is which, they might subtly hint that the person is getting a placebo. It probably wouldn't be as blatant as, here's your placebo pill. But you don't want them subtly hinting that that person's not getting a real headache medication because that's going to be a lurking variable and it's going to mess with your results. There's a lot of vocab here. There's a lot to keep track of. Most students have a pretty easy time explaining why they would do one thing or another, but struggle to come up with the vocab and struggle to keep these two things separate, the sampling methods and the experimental design. So I highly recommend either a graphic organizer like something like this or like flashcards or something because if you know the vocab, you'll be able to explain any experimental design you want to create and any sampling method that you want to use.